Years ago, a large statue of Christ was erected in the Andes on the border between Argentina and Chile. Called Christ of the Andes, the statue symbolizes a pledge between the two countries. As long as the statue stands, there will be peace between Chile and Argentina. Shortly after the statue was erected, the Chileans began to protest that they had been slighted. The statue had its back turned towards Chile. Just when tempers were at their highest in Chile, a Chilean newspaperman saved the day in an editorial that not only satisfied the people, but made them laugh. He simply said, the people of Argentina need more watching over than the Chileans. <laughs> Our words are incredibly powerful, aren't they? They can inflame a situation or diffuse a situation. You've certainly experienced this in your life. The wrong words cause great pain and heartache, and the right words in the right way soothe the soul. Conflict is a time when words become very important. Even more so are our actions. As Christians, we have an opportunity to do great good in the face of conflict. Let's pray again together this morning as we continue. Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue with us now. Open our hearts and minds, speak to us from your word, and may we be drawn to be more like you this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we continue our series on conflict. Two weeks ago we began in a message entitled Understanding Conflict. We talked about some of the responses we can have when we go into conflict. And today we continue that series in talking about how we can glorify God in conflict. There's so much conflict in our world today, from how we respond to COVID, to racial tensions across our nation, to the relationships we deal with on a daily basis. Conflict nearly, nearly always ends with negative results. But what if that wasn't the case? What if we could turn conflict into a positive experience? Corinth was a busy city center. Geographically, it was located on the isthmus between uh, Peloponnesus and the mainland, Greece. It was a very advantageous spot. A lot of overland traffic passing through Corinth from down here in the south up to the north. In addition to the busyness of the land traffic, Corinth also uh, was situated between the Saronic Gulf in the east and the Gulf of Corinth in the west. So much of the commerce between Asia and Europe also passed right through Corinth. And though the city was situated in a very favorable geographic location, it did have its challenges. The Seventh-day Adventist commentary points out that Corinth was cursed with licentiousness to such an extent that, they, that the very name of the city became a byword for sensuality. The expression to Corinthianize signified luxurious profligacy. Now, maybe you didn't quite digest those words. I had to look it up, honestly. Simply put, Corinthian society lived by the idea, have it your own way. Do what you want. Just do it. We don't recognize those terms, do we? But this is the Corinthian society. And it was in this context that Paul writes a letter to his beloved church in Corinth. And he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for your glory. No? That wasn't what Paul said. He wasn't saying what everybody else was saying. No. No, Paul was quite counterculture. He says, don't do it for yourself. Do everything to glorify God. Everything you do should glorify Him. He says, whatever happens in your life, do everything for the glory of God. And this contrasted with the way many lived life in Corinth. They were focused on themselves. We get caught up in the same idea, don't we? Doing what we want without the slightest thought of anyone else? Now, let's take conflict just as an example. When there is conflict, who do we look out for? We look out for ourselves, right? 
But when there's a problem, I'm looking out for my best interest. I'm watching out for me. In addition, we tend to focus primarily on a horizontal plane. You do this to me, I'm going to do this to you. It's this horizontal fight between people. We're selfish, not considering others. And in every conflict, there is a moment of truth. Now, you probably know what I'm talking about. You may have been there this past week, maybe even this morning. It's that moment when we can let a grenade go. Where you can explode and say everything that's on your mind. We can get our revenge out. We can unleash our emotions. And just like a grenade, when we choose to respond to conflict this way, there is shrapnel. Damage happens. But I want to suggest that there's another option. There's another way that we can deal with conflict. You see, conflict doesn't just affect you and me. There's a third party involved in every conflict. There is a vertical dimension to our conflict. It doesn't just affect you and I on the horizontal plane. It also affects the vertical plane. So instead of responding to conflict with a grenade on a strictly horizontal plane, we can choose to respond with a fire extinguisher in a vertical plane. In order to do this, we have to ask the question, what would please and honor God in this situation? How can we bring God into this conflict? How can we bring that vertical plane into this horizontal fight? How can we do everything for God's glory? And this is a difficult question to ask, especially in the heat of the moment but it's the best thing we can possibly do. When it, want, when it comes to conflict, I'm going to suggest this morning that there are four opportunities that we have. Four opportunities in conflict. First of all, we can glorify God. Have you ever thought about glorifying God in conflict? I believe it's possible. We can also serve others in conflict. We can grow personally through conflict, and we can even grow corporately through conflict. So our first opportunity that I want to look at this morning in conflict is to glorify God. You see, as Christians, there is a lot on the line. The way we carry ourselves, the way we socialize, what we eat, what we drink, everything we do reflects on our claim that we are like Christ. Conflict is no different. The way we behave in conflict says much about our claim of Christianity. Many Christians have done a lot of harm to the name of Christ by the way they have dealt with conflict. Many people have been turned off from the church because of the way we have dealt with conflict. I remember a number of years ago, I was with a young lady, and we were going door to door to do a survey in our community to find out how could we best serve our community. And I remember we went to this one gentleman's house and his camper was parked out front. He was inside and we could hear him and he was coming in and out. And so we went over to him and said, hey, we're from this church and we're looking how we can help our community. Wondering if you'd ask some questions. And he says, you know, you tell me why Christians have killed more people than anybody else in the history of the world and then we can talk about what you can do in the community. This young girl that was with me had just been baptized. She was no more than 11 or 12, maybe 10. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> this is what she gets to hear? But it is so true. How many millions of people were killed in the Crusades in the name of Christ because of conflict? What has that done to the name of, the, of Christ down through the ages? How you respond to conflict, how has that affected other people's idea of who Christ is and the way he handles us when we mess up? Our first opportunity in conflict is to bring glory to God. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 37, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the new day. Notice what he does not say here. He does not say, strike out and get vengeance. He doesn't say, lash out with every emotion that comes to mind. 
No, he says, commit to the Lord. Commit this challenge, whatever it is. Commit this conflict to the Lord, and he will bring it to fruition. He will justify you. When we come into conflict, if we will commit that conflict to the Lord, he will work it out. Now, this is not a promise that we won't have conflict, and it's not a promise that that conflict won't be hard. But it is a promise that he will work it out for his glory if we will commit that conflict to him. Paul challenges us through Ephesians chapter 5. He says, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We are to imitate Christ. Now think for a moment. Did Christ ever deal with conflict? (laughs) Sure, there was lots of conflict in his life, right? And how did he deal with it? Did he throw out every four-letter word that he possibly could in a blue streak? Did he lash out and start beating people up and, and verbally abusing them? No. Certainly, there were a couple of occasions where Jesus did come out with very strong words. His father's temple was being abused. He did stand up. But time after time, when accusations were leveled against him, how did Jesus respond? With love, with gentleness, with redemption. He was humble, he was kind in his response, even to those who were driving rough spikes in his hands and his feet. What did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When they were driving stakes through his hands... One of the hardest times to love others is when we are physically or mentally struggling. The last thing we want to do is be loving. We want them to feel our pain, our agony. They deserve it because they're causing it. But Jesus gave us an example, and he loved those around him. And then we are told to be imitators of Christ. Friends, conflict is an opportunity to bring glory to God, and this demands our rising above our nature and loving those who have hurt us. Peter writes clearly in 1 Peter 2, he says, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You notice what Peter says here? He says, even in conflict, we're to treat others with love and respect. We are to do so much good that even though they call us evildoers, they will have to recognize by our actions that something's different, that God is in us. Our actions need to speak as loudly as our words, and those actions will bring glory to God. Now, maybe you say, okay, I can be nice to other people. I can put on a face. Uh, We can wear masks. We all do it, right? I mean, when we're out in the world, we can be kind. But once the front door closes, I'm a different person to my family. That's okay, though, because I'm being good to the world, right? No, of course not. But it becomes even a bigger challenge when our conflict is not with those outside, but those within whether it be our nuclear family, whether it be our church family. We can get by with that, right? No, no, no. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says in 1 Timothy 4.12, a favorite verse of mine, when I was younger, you know, they'd always ask the question, well, what's your favorite verse? What's your favorite Bible verse? And you know, John 3.16, Romans 6.23, you know, the, the common ones. And I said, I want something different. And I was young at the time, so I chose this one. What's what's Paul tell Timothy here? He says, let no one despise your youth. Oh, I liked that. That was good earlier in ministry. I'd go to the hospital to visit somebody, and they'd say, well, who are you? You know, what's your relation? I'm the pastor. And they said, really? (laughs) You're too young, aren't you? Be, or let no one despise your youth, but, he says, be an example to the believers. Be an example to the believers. But wait a second. Wait a second, Paul. You're talking about the saints of God. They're all perfect. How can I be a witness to them? 
I mean, if you're visiting with us, you came this morning expecting to see a bunch of perfect people, right? And all of you who came here and you regularly come here, you're all perfect people, right? How can we be examples to the believers? (laughs) Because we're all messed up. We're all messed up on our own. But we can be example by the power of Christ in us, even to believers. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. We need to lift each other up. We need to be an example to one another of what Christ wants for us. Are we always going to get it right? No. I'll be the first to admit it. But we have a responsibility to be an example even within the body of Christ. Though it is difficult, as Christians, we are called to deal with conflict differently than the world around us. We need to love one another. And by doing so, we bring glory to God. Conflict provides us a second opportunity, and that second opportunity is to serve others. Now, it's easy to look at the person that we have an issue with as the enemy. When we're looking strictly on that horizontal plane, it's me versus you. We're doing this. You are the enemy. We have the whites blaming the blacks. We have the blacks blaming the whites. Everybody's pointing a finger at somebody else, and we have conflict. And it's easy to look at the other party as the enemy. But we've got to move beyond that. Many times when someone lashes out, it's because they're having personal struggles. I can remember several times when someone has lashed out at me and later I found out they were dealing with stuff. There have been times maybe when you caught me at a bad moment and I might have snapped at you. It's because I had junk going on. And we all deal with it, don't we? There are times when there's junk going on in our life and somebody catches us at the wrong moment and they catch a little bit of the edge of what's going on. Conflict provides us with the opportunity to help carry each other's burden. Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians 6, 2, and 10, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's treat each other with love and respect. Let's lift each other up instead of tearing each other down. Conflict provides us the opportunity to lift others up, to help them through their challenges. Instead of responding with their anger to their anger, with our own anger, we can choose to look for ways to do good to others. In addition, conflict gives us the opportunity to help others change through constructive confrontation. That sounds a little scary, doesn't it? (laughs) Some of you are like, all right, I can do it. Some of you say, I don't know about that. I have a bad experience with this. And it can be tricky. We have to be careful when taking this approach. But it is a biblical approach. Paul tells the Galatian church in verse 1 of chapter 6, he says, If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, and don't get puffed up, but you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Now the idea here is not, I am better than you, so I'm going to tell you how to do it. The idea is that if I see my brother or sister in Christ struggling with some kind of sin, involved in some kind of conflict, it is my responsibility as a Christian to reach out and try to help them, to point out the error, to try and lead them, try and help them through that challenge. If possible, I want to help my brother or sister in their spiritual journey. I'm not there to swat them down, to make them feel miserable. I want to help my brother or sister. Paul points out here that we are to confront with a spirit of gentleness. Too often we accuse others, we point the finger at them, and that accusation comes across harshly. Sometimes we mean it that way, sometimes we don't. 
Paul encourage us, encourages us to be gentle and loving when we seek to help each other. And as hard as it may be, we should look to serve others in conflict. Look out for their good. Conflict also provides us with a third opportunity, and that is to grow personally, to grow individually, to be more like Christ. Charlie Brown, in his book Responding to Conflict Biblically, notes the ABCs of Christian growth. ABC, right? Here it is. Adversity builds character. Like that? Adversity builds character. Last fall, um, we had a peach tree that died out in the yard, and so we said, oh, we want to replace this. We want to get a couple other trees. And so we went down to the nursery. We found some trees we wanted and, and uh, went in and talked to the guy and said, okay, how do we do this? We've never planted trees before. And so he told us, you know, do this, do that, do the other thing. And I said, well, don't we need to stake the trees? He said, no, don't do that. As the wind blows, they will strengthen. Huh. And you know this spring... Those trees are still there. They've come on. They're beautiful. One of them died, but that's besides the point. I think that was something different. But the, the trees have been blown by the wind. They have strengthened. The, the, if I grab the trunk of the tree, even though it's only this big, it's got tension. It has been built through the adversity. Adversity builds character. And I would suggest that you and I are like those trees. And the wind is like conflict in our life. As it blows, as it beats against us, it makes us stronger. One of my favorite Bible writers, James, points out this very thing in James chapter 1. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy when you fall into trials. Now, how many of you, when conflict comes, says, yay! If you do, shame on you. No. Um, we don't go looking for conflict, most of us. Now, I know some people that do. They, they just do whatever they can to start a something or other. Um, but most of us don't go searching for conflict. Conflict happens to find us. We don't have to go looking. And when we come into conflict, the best thing we can do is to pause. To turn to Jesus and let him work through the conflict. Though it can be very difficult, we need to listen to James and what he says in James 1.19. He says, be slow to speak. Be patient. Take some time before responding to a conflict. After all, a quick response to conflict often leads to an explosion. Why? Because our nature is evil. We naturally do what is wrong. Without God in the life, what do we do? We do all kinds of destructive things that kills us. Our nature is not good. Not by ourselves. Do you really think that when your defenses are up, that you're going to calmly address any given confrontation? It's counterculture to do so. A knee jerk reaction is rarely going to be the right result. Instead, we need to take a moment to ask ourselves some questions. We need to submit this conflict to Jesus, and we need to be patient. If we will slow down and ask the right questions, we can find opportunities for growth, even in conflict. Ellen White puts it this way in Christ's Objects Lessons. She says, through conflict, the spiritual life is strengthened. It's like the guy that goes to the gym, right? Okay, maybe some of you go to the gym. Uh, some of these guys go to the gym, and what do they go there for? Because they want guns, right? Right? So some of them take steroids and all the rest of it. But, but a lot just go in there and they pump the iron. Now, is that something easy or hard? It's hard. I don't like going to the gym. <laughs> it's hard work. You got to find a heavy weight and you got to pick the stupid thing up. And then you let it down and you do it again. 
It's crazy. It's hard work. And all that, all that hard work creates little injury. And that injury heals stronger than it was before. And we get stronger through adversity. Those things make us stronger. Ellen White says, through conflict, the spiritual life is strengthened. It's not easy. It hurts, but it strengthens us. She says, trials well-born will develop steadfastness of character and precious spiritual graces. The perfect fruit of faith, meekness, and love often matures best amid storm clouds and darkness. This process will mature us. It will make us perfect and complete. Now, don't misunderstand me. We don't need to go looking for trouble. Trouble will find us. But we need to look for the opportunities for growth through the trial that we face. Alfred Poirier points out in his book, The Peacemaking Pastor, he says, conflict tries our true theology. Let me say that again. Conflict tries our true theology. It's when we get in the thick of difficulties that who we truly are comes out. We can say Jesus loves you. We can say love your neighbor as yourself. We can say whatever we want. But until we're in conflict, we may not show our true colors. But when everything comes crashing down, how do we respond? Conflict tries our true theology. It tests us and sifts our hearts, revealing what we truly believe and hold fast to. Rather than perceiving conflict as an obstacle to our ministry, he says, we can welcome it as an opportunity to minister. So in conflict, we have the opportunity to grow personally. It won't be easy, it won't be fun, but we will grow if we hold on to Jesus. Finally, We can grow corporately through conflict. We can grow corporately by honoring differences as a source of richness and strength. This very thing that causes us frustration and conflict can also provide strength. Think about marriage for a moment. Marriage has never brought you any heartache, has it? (laughs) If so, I'd love to find out your secret. (laughs) Marriage is hard. It's hard work. There's heartache that happens because we're different people. We don't do everything the same. We have to learn how to deal with somebody else that does things different than me. Though Lisa and I are different in our likes and dislikes, together we are well-rounded. I'll go out and I'll write something or or, want to respond to somebody in a certain way and she'll say, Chris, don't do that. That's dumb. Oh, you're right, babe. And I back off. And it, it makes it better. We, we make each other better. We're, me- we're more well-rounded together. We're stronger together than if we were apart. And children. <laughs> Woo-wee. That's a doozy. Each child has their own unique personality. If it weren't for Karina, we wouldn't have nearly as much laughter in our family. She loves to laugh. If it weren't for Jacob, we may not be quite as driven to get some other things done. If it wouldn't be for Clara, we wouldn't say, oh. And all those things working together make our family stronger. Corporately, we are stronger than when we're apart. Conflict can strengthen us corporately. Differences of opinion, methods, and purposes, even when they bring frustration, are often a result of God's plan. God doesn't want us to be in conflict, but he uses it for our benefit. It's likely that conflict in our life has been allowed to help us grow. Maybe we need to learn not to make poor choices. Maybe um, we just need to learn how to follow God's plan. Paul talks about this strength in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. The strengths of all of us combined are stronger than all our individual pieces. And this corporate strength is one of the reasons that I believe that this church is the place that it is today. Though we don't always agree, when a decision is made, we all get on board and we work together. 
It's an example of Christ, what Christ would have us to do. Ellen White says it this way in Testimonies for the Church. She says, Many people may be brought together in a unity of religious faith whose opinions, habits, and tastes in temporal matters are not in harmony. Now, I imagine if I were to say right now, go down the row, and okay, what's your political affiliation? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? We would create a division in the church, right? Because we all have our own opinions, our own beliefs, our own dearly held thoughts and traditions on whatever issue we may bring up. And if we were to be uh, focused on that only, we would just blow apart, But she goes on to say, she says, but if they have the love of Christ glowing in their bosom, coming from inside of them, and are looking forward to the same heaven as their eternal home, they may have the sweetest and most intelligent communion together and a unity the most wonderful. She doesn't say uniformity. She says unity. We're different. Praise the Lord. And when we come together with our differences and our uniquenesses and and all our different opinions, it makes us stronger and it's a beautiful thing. We can have unity because our goal is the same. We want to be in heaven and we want everybody to be with us. I can overlook the differences we may have politically because that really doesn't matter because we're going there and that's what counts. Friends, that, I believe, is what we experience here in this church. We have differences. You and I are different. We talk different. We think different. We do things different. And that's okay because you and I are still looking to Jesus. We're still looking to heaven. We're looking forward to that day coming very soon when Jesus will come and take us to be with him. And because of that, we're strong. Friends, conflict is nothing new. And as long as we live on this earth, there will be conflict. For you and I, this gives us the opportunity to glorify God through the conflict we experience, to serve each other as equals, to grow personally through the conflict we experience, and to grow corporately by honoring the differences we all have and choosing to honor one another. Today, I want to challenge you to look at at conflict in a way that you may not have ever looked at it before. Instead of an opportunity to vindicate yourself, look to serve the person who you have conflict with. Instead of destroying someone else with your wit or logic, lift them up. When conflict arises, ask, how can God be glorified through this situation? And even before it feels impossible to continue, seek God's counsel on how to handle that conflict. You might be able to help someone else grow, you might be able to grow yourself. Whatever the case, I challenge you to use conflict as an opportunity to glorify God. Father in heaven, we live in a sinful world where conflict abounds. Our nation seems to be coming apart at the seams with a conflict that is brewing across our nation. But Lord, as your children, may we stand up. May we look at conflict as an opportunity, an opportunity to lift each other up, to join hands across the nation, to put our eyes on you. Lord, may you draw us close to you. May you use the conflict in our lives as a way to grow us, to be the people you want us to be. Bless us today. Bless us as we go out into a new week. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here together this morning. And Lord, may you be glorified in the conflict that we face. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.